At what age should your puppy sleep through the night without a potty break? So I'm not sure if there's some exact age. Yeah, I think yeah. it's more about the puppy. I've had three month old dogs that will sleep for 12 hours. And then I've had six month old dogs that get you maybe seven. Yeah. So I think it's just more about how's the dogs like. Can demeanor, they, yeah, calmness. Demeanor, can they hold it? Do they wake up at 6 a.m. and then just wag the tail until they wake you up? Like what's their energy level? What's their motivation level? I've come across retrievers that when they get them from the breeder at eight, nine, ten weeks old, they can stay in crate for seven, eight hours overnight right away. Mm -hmm. Now during the day, they've got a potty every hour to hour and a half. It's different daytime and nighttime. Daytime, it's like yeah. they're awake and their brain is stimulated. They're always doing something unless they're in the crate for that hour and a half and they can sleep. But at night, they go into like a hibernation mode. Same thing for you. You don't wake up to pee every two hours, just like your dog would. Hey, I mean, I gotta relate it to us. Unless you're my dad. <laughs> he wakes up every three hours. Uh, follow up. How do you know when they are ready to sleep all night without a potty break? So I think it's kind of the same thing. How do you know when they are ready to? I start pushing them a little yeah. bit. So I mean, maybe I got a dog that sleeps until five. I will push them as late as I possibly can before they go to bed. So instead of putting them in the crate at seven and then expecting them to sleep until seven the next day, I'll put them in the crate at seven or eight if they need that, but then I'll take them out right before I go, go to bed, maybe 10 or 1130 for a quick potty break. No stimulation, I'm not like, sit, come, good, woo. It's literally like, get them through the door, sit, good, treat, get them out the door, give them a chance to potty, walk them in, no love, no affection, just business, two to transaction. Five. Giving them a chance to potty is like two to five minutes yeah. tops. Not 20 minutes of like walking out there. Now they're yeah. fully awake and they're gonna be barking in the crate maybe, but put them back in the crate, and then maybe get to that five hour, that uh, 5 a.m. mark that you normally get to. Whatever you would normally get yeah. to. Yeah, and then push them by 15, 20 minutes. If you got a dog that's whining a little bit, try pushing them 10, 15 minutes. And again, I apologize apologize if they pee in the crate. It, it happens. Happen. It's how you learn, it's yeah. how you figure things out. But without that, then we're, we're never setting them up for success because we're always expecting failure. Yeah. Push them at 15, 20 minutes, they make it good, take them out for a potty, next day push them, an extra 30 minutes, so 5.30 instead of 5.15, or six or seven, whatever right. number they're normally waking up at. And then make sure you, you it's uh, three hours of no water before bedtime. Ooh. And if they played and got a lot of water even three hours before bedtime, you're probably taking them out if they're, if they're free every 30 minutes <laughs> until yeah. bedtime. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, move nice. on. Carrie, love watching your live. Did we just do the same thing? Oh my god! <laughs> I never really did the two. She told me it looks nerdy. <laughs> no, yeah, I, that's right. I forgot about that. <laughs> I told not to do that. Totally the south. I actually did it, but one was off. <laughs> we do, we do these. We do online. It's actually coming up. We have another round of online puppy classes. Um, and he kept like doing this. Like, stop doing that. You're not Ponzi. God. I, I thought it looked pretty cool. I'm just god. saying. It doesn't. It didn't. <laughs> it doesn't. Okay. Anyway. Carrie says, can you give me some tips on how to deal with reactive Spoo? He freaks out whenever I he- I name Spoo. Oh, I hope so. Okay, I thought it was a poo at first. Okay, anyway, he freaks out whenever he sees another dog that's over five pounds, which is almost every dog. He's currently two, two years old, you think? I assume two years old. And we tried socializing him at a young age. He's not on Prozac or, or anything. Um, which we, oh, we do give him trazodone for stressful situations like grooming in the vet. Okay, two years old. This is a whole nother category, Carrie. Different um, ball game. It's a whole different ball game. It's make sure you have control of your dog's head. So you need to have some sort of training tool or slip leash or something on the dog that's not flat collar. Make sure you're practicing calm leadership in the house, waiting at thresholds, accountability for bad decisions. Do not baby your dog. Don't share any softness with your dog in those situations um, because it can. you get what you pet. So if your dog gets nervous about something, they need you to be like, hey, good job, let's go, come on. Or not good job, but hey, let's go, let's move it, I got this, um, in order to build confidence in you and your ability to control your environment. There are some exceptions. Uh, for instance, some dogs will, when they're really, really nervous, you remember Biscuit that was here and then came to me? What they do is like, we have the strand. We have like a green belt along the beach, it's super busy. And um, this family, once they did a ton of work at home in their neighborhood, in their yard, a few months later, they started to work in the busy area. And then what they'll do is they'll do a stretch on the very busy strand. And then they will tuck into these little cul-de-sacs where these uh, fancy homes are. And it's not so busy. And then they sit and give Biscuit a little massage. 
and they rest and then they go and do the strand again and they, they it's all leadership let's go biscuit we got this come on nope let's go you're not fearful we're moving through this you can do this and then they give the dog a break and they settle down and they give cheese and they give biscuit a little massage um, so anyway, Can I break something down before you move on from there. The massage is not coddling. That's not loving right. on the dog. It's different. You have a coach that's like, good job, pal, pat him on the back. But it'd be a little bit weird if he like rubbed your kid's back. So it's a difference of being like, good job versus like, it's okay, it's okay. So this, this is, this tells the dog it's okay to be nervous and anxious. And we don't want that. But like, hey, good job. This is like stimulating, but in a good way. This is slow and relaxing. Good. So they can kind of settle Good and then job. you move into it. Yeah. yeah, so it's energy level too. It's okay, it's okay. Versus, good, good job, bud. Like calm, mm -hmm. assertive, good. You're okay, yep. good. But you don't do that when they're panicking or something. You don't do that when a dog walks by. You get through the moment, settle the dog back down with the obedience work that you've done, and then you take a break and chill out. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much to this. I hope that gives you like a, a little start. Like I hope that gives you like a, a nugget to, to move forward. Um, you build, con honest to God, you build confidence, focus, all of that. You do all that muscle memory when your dog is not nervous. So if you're only trying to work your dog on a walk when they're seeing other dogs, you're, you're, you're never going to get to where you need to get to. You need to work on all of that muscle memory in the home, in the backyard, and a neighborhood walk where they don't see that many dogs, and you can work at a distance. Um, and then once you're in the thick of it, you're just getting through it and then giving your dog a break. And getting through it and giving your dog a break. Both of those scenarios are necessary when you're trying to build confidence with your dog. But you're not trying to get focused and really work with your dog in the moment when they're at their peak escalation of nervousness or fear or, or reactivity. Um, if, if your dog is reactive, even if it's from fear, we're like, no, cut it out. This is my job. Let's go. You know, it, it's like, cut it out. And then I build confidence in other situations like climbing bleachers and jumping up on objects, following my lead, uh, like turning, stop and sit down on a walk where there's nothing going on. I'm building muscle memory when it's low, low distraction. And then when the, the distraction really hits, I'm, I'm powering through. I got this, nope, cut it out, let's go. Then when the dog calms down, I go back to confidence building again. Anyway, that's, that's such a short answer for such a, a big, big issue. Um, but hopefully that gives you like something to start with. Okay, all right. Nancy, Nancy Ann, oh that's super cute. Nancy Ann says, I'm an 11 month old lab mix. So we've got another older dog. Not quite two, but still adolescent dog. When he sees other dogs, especially at daycare or at the dog park, he gets so excited, he plays too rough. How can I get him to be calm and more gentle? You want to start with this one? So gentle, I think you may not have a dog that's necessarily going to be gentle, but you probably have a dog that you, you could break the play a little bit sooner and work him through that situation. It actually feeds off a little bit what Bethany just mentioned. You don't have a dog that's nervous and possibly a little bit like fear aggressive, but you have a dog that's just overstimulated. So you're trying to work them below threshold and threshold is a phrase that some dog, tra dog trainers will use or it basically means the threshold is where they jump on another dog, they show a lot of that energy. Working them below threshold means that you get them to that point where they want to jump and then you work right below that. Yeah. You work them through all that big energy that they've created that their brain automatically associates with playing with other dogs or that daycare that wherever he is. And then once you get them calm in that situation, you get a little bit closer to it. The whole thing is you're trying to work them through the situation. You're not just trying to correct the playfulness and create a gentle dog. My dog doesn't play like that. She will always be that rough playing dog, but I know how to get her to a point to where she can play a little bit better with certain dogs that aren't at that level. So you're trying to create versatility with play. What do you want to add? You, you sound so positive, but you're not, a, I'm not, I'm not trying to be me, but I'm going to be the bad guy. You, you know, Nancy, good cop, bad cop. Good cop, bad cop. You're not at daycare, so you can't control your dog. They have to control your dog. It doesn't matter how much, well, that's not true. I shouldn't say it doesn't matter how much work you do on your own, but at the end of the day, your dog most likely will take advantage of those people at daycare who don't hold your dog accountable. They're not trainers. They're not trainers in the same way that you might be, you know, at the dog park or in other dog scenarios. So yeah, you, you need more impulse control. On top of what he said, 
Um, you probably need more impulse control work. Uh, we all do. <laughs> we do and our dogs do. But you need more of it outside of those situations. So stop going to the dog park. First, go to a regular park and make sure your dog moves when you ask them to. Like you can just walk across the dog park and turn and your dog turns with you. And then work on a really good recall. Then work on your dog seeing another dog and dog come, comes to you, lays down, settles, watches that dog go by. If you can't do that, you'll never be able to get a calmer dog during play. You're building up your threshold outside of the challenging situation. Yeah. Exactly what she mentioned on the last one, you're never gonna get through that situation if you always try to tackle it head on. You're finding, getting them past it or working them before it even happens, you're calming them down in that situation, building up that muscle memory to look to you instead of the other dog, and then maybe eventually you'll get that calmer dog later on. Sound like going the same page? Yeah, yeah, no, sounds exactly, yeah, I'm with you. And we don't have as many questions today, so I'm gonna tack on to that just story time. I have, I have time. To we don't usually do stories on this. We have a couple TikTok questions oh. too. Okay. <laughs> I'm still telling my story. You can still tell your story. Still telling my story. So um, we have a dog right now that um, I worked with as a puppy puppy, like little 12 week old puppy, about a year and a half, two years old as a doodle, a standard doodle, huge, wild. So I've got two dogs in my pack that are very friendly. They, they love to play. One's more submissive, one's really pushy, which is Dakota. They both don't like this dog. It, too much. Too, too yeah. much. And it's a good dog. It's, it's, it, she hump, he humps sometimes, but other than that, he's a really good player. He's just like this and pushy and, yep. and in their face all the time. And Dakota has been so rough with him. And then the other dog snapped at him twice. And, I was, and I've never seen her do that before, ever. And I was just really surprised. And so anyway, uh, I've been working with this dog for about a week, just no more play, just trying to bring him down. And he's not magically playing differently. But what is happening now is when he gets a little bit too much like this, I can kind of move into the yard and he like sees me and slows down a little bit. And so that's really, that's relationship. That's relationship. That's Spatial it. pressure. Yeah. Teaching him that you're the top dog, you're in charge of the play, yeah. rather than him setting the tone, him setting the rules. Because I've been working with him so much for the last week, but it didn't, it hasn't changed his play style. And it's not gonna change how some dogs like to play with him and some dogs don't, you know? So sometimes you, a dog doesn't have to vibe with everybody. And let's face it, a daycare and a, we didn't even, we forgot to say this, we, we don't even advise dog parks, first of all, because it's like Russian roulette of dogs. And but we're not gonna tell you you can't go there. We just want you to have a bit of a different perspective. And then daycare, I wouldn't do it every day. We advise, only, if you can, I know some people can't depending on where they live or their work, but we advise that people maybe pull it for a little while and then only do it once a week and then twice a week, uh, like building back up to see how it changes their dog's behavior, three days at the most. Because yeah, if their main association with dogs is drivey, it's really hard to control that drive as well as walk calmly down the street by other dogs. So anyway, just some perspective. Well, something you said too, actually made me think about this. If you were to hire a trainer in your area, wherever they are, and you prevent yourself going to that uh, daycare place for even a week or two, and that trainer teaches you how to get your dog's attention when that dog is high stem, then you can even kind of transfer over that mentality. Obviously the people at daycare, daycare wouldn't know exactly what you're doing, but what happens is when they naturally kind of step in to break up that play or at least to separate the dogs, your dog may show them a little bit more lever or yeah. leeway yeah. and back off just with their presence. Potentially. You're teaching respect from, from humans and that will transfer over to other people as long as they're not too soft and not getting too much affection. Yeah. Potentially, it's good. Okay, it's a good tip. Out. Let's jump to our TikTok questions. Is it harder to train smaller dogs? I think so. Yeah, I love training smaller dogs, but I I think it's harder. Yes, takes more food and a lot more guidance. Well, That's the biggest difference. And you still, they're still dogs. In fact, they're wild little animals. <laughs> they wild, also tend to get carried wild more little often. predators, and, and and yeah, they get carried more often, so they're they're more ruined <laughs> from an early age. And I think they're more difficult. They're more difficult to potty train. Um, but they're just as driven, if sometimes not more driven, than larger dogs. Sure. And the trick is they still need to learn boundaries and body language and all of that. Um, but you have to be more gentle about it. You have to have more, I think, more skill sometimes with it. Because it's not like some golden, retrie golden retriever jumping on me and I'm like, hey, knock it off. 
And they're just like, okay. And with a little dog, it's it's more precise. You it's do, more do subtle. Little back flips if you do that. Yes. So it's got to be a softer approach. It's more, more yeah. It's much more subtle, and you're looking for more more cues and things like that. And and then you're accidentally probably nurturing too much of like he said, like the holding and mm -hmm. the jumping up is not as big of a deal. You're like, oh hi, you know, I let my little dogs jump up on me. It's it's not a big deal, but they still need to get out of my way if I ask them to. But you better believe that in the early stages, from you know the point you get them to two years old, if you muddle that too much, it gets confusing for them. So that's why I think um, it's harder, harder for traders, harder for normal owners. And I see you have a chihuahua, yeah. so. Chihuahua. <laughs> um, so hard. One thing I like to recommend to people is, so a lot of vets will say, don't put anything around your dog's neck. For and a chihuahua, for a chihuahua. We follow that same principle, but there are certain training tools when introduced by a trainer, not just your average Joe going on Amazon buying something that has high reviews. Or someone who does a lot of research. Yeah, that's true. And has like looked at YouTube videos, hers, ours, wherever we need. Hours and and hours. then that tool has to stay high up on the head with a proper trainer. You can introduce a training tool onto a, a smaller dog if used properly. If used properly, so yeah. don't just limit yourself to one tool because you read everything about it saying that they have weak tracheas or weak necks. You could use a tool that we were mentioning earlier, something that controls the head, oh, as yeah. long as introduced properly. That's the key factor. There are some tools that, that you can have control of the head, um, but it's the nose, and there's other tools that are actually designed not to put any direct pressure on the trachea, so stay away from like flat collars and things yep. like that. Oh, I just hit my mic. That might have sounded weird. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but anyway, hopefully that helps. We'll do the next one. Is there another one? I think that's it. It was a repeat. Okay, cool. Let me... Ah! I think we have one more. Yeah, we do. I just wanted to check. Instagram. Nope. Lots of people just saying hi. Hello. Uh, <laughs> we've got that I'm one. I'm going to let you read that one because you're better at paraphrasing. All right, Tamika. I, um, well, I haven't pre-read it though, so I can't paraphrase it. Four-month-old puppy treats uh, with only treats uh, as well as kibble three times a day. Bingo. Recently, I've removed the bowl, switched to training with her food during mealtime. This has presented uh, some questions and issues. If I aim to have her finish all her food, the training session seems too long, as it used to be 15 minute intervals with treats. This is really throwing off her schedule and probably yours too. She doesn't always want the food and becomes uninterested. How do I continue training? These are great questions. Okay, do I stop the treats altogether so she isn't refusing the food? Okay. Alright, alright, cool. These it sounds are, like it's going to be a good positive reinforcement route. This so. is someone that is doing their work. Way to go, Tamika. Okay, so first of all, I would say well done on switching to kibble. You want to switch away from treats as quickly as possible, and then you can only add treats back in whenever you're doing something outside with higher distractions. It is really common what you're going through. So what I would say is uh, a few things. Might be a quick answer, and then you can add to it if you want. I would say quick do it. Answer. Quick Shut up. I can do I can be quick. Yeah, I'm gonna be quick. Handful of food whenever uh, you're doing it, instead of like one or two pieces at a time, sit, break handful of food rather than the few pieces, and then um, just give the rest in a bowl. Train for 10, 15 minutes, and then have the dog wait and give them the rest of it in their food bowl. And if they don't want it because they're not hungry, give it to them in crate for five, 10 minutes. And if they don't eat, pull the pull the food. Um, maybe as she's getting older, she doesn't need as much as much kibble. That's that's possible. You want to add on to that? No, pretty much hit everything. Woo! Age is everything. Too much food, cut down on the amount of food. Find that golden like that golden amount. Don't ever do what it says on the food bag. They want you to buy more dog food, so they want you to feed more dog food to your dog. It's, I think the studies are on like may like intact. Um, active males. Or you see dogs that are eating a ton of food because they're running all day long. Yeah, and they're intact and they're, mm -hmm. they're male. So you should Wait, cut down so you're saying the food on the dog containers, it's actually more than you should feed? It's a lie. It's really? Yes, yeah. it's a lie. For, for most, yeah, it's for most. I mean, unless you have a really, really active dog at home, you always want to look at genetics, but it's look at the dog, not the, the amount that the dog is, is eating. Um, my dogs eat drastically different in the winter than they do in the summers out here. I feel like I feed them hardly anything at all in the summers in California. But if I don't, they get chunky, and we are against chunkiness in our dogs. People, Short their life. People are really different. Fresh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the COVID twenty is still there. <laughs> all right. Um. So just to just because we've twelve. Oh, is it? Time. While you're doing that, is a raw diet better than kibble? 
I think it's just different. I feed raw diet. It's, I mean, don't, don't be nice. It's better. Yeah, it's better. It's a pain in the butt, but it's better. It's way better um, for the dog. Okay, well, let's give alternatives. So, um, gosh, why can't I remember it now? We feed one of our dogs a steak diet. Just, just, just no, 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 not just food for dogs, because that's only a local company. There's a uh, farmer dog, which they'll ship to you. All their food is shipped, so it's really easy to do. You can do Instinct Raw, which you can get from PetSmart, uh, Petco. This is, at, this is at least like lightly cooked food. Do yeah. People no, no, that's all. That's all still raw. Oh. That's all actual raw. Oh. Farmer's dog is raw too. Um, no, it's cooked. Farmer's is cooked. Farmer's dog is cooked. Yeah. Okay. And then they're, there's they're one other company food. that does fresh, dehydrated fresh food. food. Yeah, fresh food is dehydrated good. is good. It's just it's very costly. Um, I do. It is, but it's easier because you don't have to refrigerate it. A lot of people like it just because of that. Well, eat raw food is costly. Is what I was gonna say. Sure, it's raw all food costly. is really costly. My my dogs do, and my two elderly dogs do uh, full raw. And then my two, one of them's still older, but uh, the two others do half raw, half kibble. Because it's pricey. For my one dog, I spend about 200 bucks a month. Just oh, for one dog. Sparky, little Miss Lady Love has got your back. Thank the you. Honest Kitchen. Kitchen. There we go. Honest Kitchen. There we go. That's Kimberly. Yeah. <laughs> but you That's know, the actual work girlfriend. <laughs> but you know what's, what's really doable? Um, first like more financially doable that is getting more and more popular and I'm totally on board for is uh, doing kibble doing the best version of kibble there's a there's a website called dogfoodadvisor.com it, it's it's not the end all be all but it does give you a, an idea like a breakdown of what you're looking at they do a lot of dog food brands so do kibble and then add some protein add some other people food you know and you do raw mixers eggs, and, you find other and things. eggs yeah. um, and it will mess your dog's stomach up if they're not used to it you know we're talking about don't do the shell though we're talking, so we're talking some, about food with yeah. actual nutrients so can't yeah. you grind the shell up you can but no one's gonna grind the shell let's be honest i do uh, wow <laughs> a couple times a week i grind the shells up with the animal. <laughs> I love my dogs. No, I'm just How kidding. about okay. a breed recommendation? So what kind of dog would be Ooh. up to a little under your hip and recommended for a first dog owner? Okay, so... Burn a doodle? Burn a doodle. <laughs> I, we get a lot of doodles here at Puppy Cat. We get a ton of them. And burn some a, of them are, burn a yeah, doodle. Labradoodle, golden doodle. They are good when they hit two years old. But from a young age to that point, maybe five, maybe I'll mention maybe middle three. But a Bernadoodle, they're super chill dogs. But usually, they're also usually, we not to your hip. Ones. They're like to the rib. Oh, yeah, they're, they're, they're a little, little taller. They're a little bigger. Even That's as true. a bigger dog, they're still pretty darn chill. What else? Don't go by small size because small size dogs actually tend to be higher energy because they're smaller and they're like more compact. Yeah, just do, um, do really do your due diligence, do your research. There's tons of videos and blogs on all the different types of dogs. Yeah. Um, you know, it just depends. You want to, you definitely want one that fits your lifestyle. The ones that are calmer, like like a greyhound. Cavalier King Charles. Well, I was thinking bigger dog. Uh, greyhounds oh, are huge, okay. but uh, greyhounds uh, or whippets, whippets, they're yeah. they're great. They, they do require a sensitivity when training, but they're really great, you know, for dog owners. But they tend to be really needy and have separation anxiety. Medical issues too. Medical issue. Well, isn't that every dog now? No, Seriously. Not as much. Yeah, whatever. So anyway, it's <laughs> can you think of anything else? Like what that height? Oh, I, I always mention Cavalier King Charles. I know that's, that's not up to little. the hip. I know it's not up to the hip, but if you want a good mentality dog, a calm dog, like a good family dog, maybe for like an elderly like parent or something like that, or just like a good family dog for kids, yeah. Cavalier King Charles, super great dog. Beagle calm. mixed with a pug. Nope, lies. Mm -mm. Don't you hug nope. Just because you have had one bad experience, it doesn't paint all of them. Beagles are high energy, pugs are high energy. Yeah, but they, they're not like... Okay, anyway, clearly we were not prepared for this question, so hopefully we gave you some ideas. Differing of opinion. She, I she think. get better, you get better advice going on Google. All right, we had another question pop, uh, pop up. I have a doggo Argentino, and he doesn't like to listen and is destructive. Do you have any advice? Bethany, it's you. That's, that's... I think that's their MO. I think it says that on their rap sheet. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, yes, I have some advice. I don't know how, how old your dogo is, um, but if you have not gone online to see what they're bred for, and not just what they're bred for, but seen them in action, first of all, you need to do that. Uh, they, yeah, you need to know. You need to know where they're coming from, even if they're genes. Six months, almost seven. Okay, even if their genetics are kind of watered down, 
you you definitely need to go watch some dogo videos see them in their own element you know and and what they what they do so anyway six months old that's every dog like what you just said at six months old is is every dog it's an adolescent dog everything you you taught them is like i got a poodle that just caused six grand worth of damage in the living room chewing up a really nice couch yep, yep. and this poodle's lazy so it's more about structure the maturity and maturity, developing yeah. structure in the home and developing boundaries so you if the dog has free roam they're going to get into things they shouldn't be getting into. That, that's what I meant by structure. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's always, we say structure, so sorry if we're not always specific. Training it's, term. It, it's a training term, but that's that's mm -hmm. exactly what it is. It's, it's no free roaming. Your, your, your six-month-old dogo should not have freedom in the house unless, you're, unless they're tethered to you and you're showing them every second of the day what they are and aren't supposed to do. They should have um, ample bouts of crate time. And then when they're out of crate, here's the thing with a dogo. When they are out of crate, you need to make sure that they are not pushing thresholds, front door or back door. They're not pushing you in the hallways, like tight to get spaces. By you. Yeah, you're blocking and saying, hey, slow down, do you, buddy. Do you want to show them what a block looks like? Hey. Oh. <laughs> but seriously. Favorite, every session, every I mean, episode. It gets harder every session. <laughs> it does. As the frustration that's, that's, builds. That's only because you haven't had your COVID shot anymore, so I'm being harsher. Now, right? this is the real, this is the real body block. Yeah. But, but no, seriously, it's like you need to be standing up with a dog that breed. If anytime I want them out of my space, I'm standing up and I'm moving into them. You want to be able to move into your dog and they, they get out of your way or they slow down, whatever it is you're asking. You, you need to have that type of communication with him in the house at this age. Everything shouldn't be treat-based and good boy and come and sit and redirection. There also should be a calmer way that you're starting to interact with your six-month-old dog where it's like, you know, put him on a leash in the house for 15 minutes a day oh, and, okay. and have him follow you around. So you, you go to the front door, turn, he should turn with you. You go around the coffee table, you turn multiple directions, you stop and sit, not with food. You just do a little leash pressure, good, and then let's go. And you're just interacting with him on a, on a different way. You A lot of leadership, a lot of guidance. Uh, and by guidance, I mean not, yay, good job with food. I mean like through the leash let's and go, body let's language. Go. It's leash and body language needs to start, you need to start doing more and more to make sure that your relationship is set in the house because the next year of your life could be, could have a lot of ups and downs with a lot of these powerful breeds when they're adolescent dogs. It's a lot of work. Let's break down the why no food. So food builds drive. Yeah, you're you're dog already. 30 seconds. Oh. <laughs> Food builds drive. You're not trying to build drive. The dog already has enough drive. You're trying to build obedience and understanding. So when that leash is attached to you and you're walking the dog says, I don't want to go, and you kind of just create gradual pressure until they say, oh, maybe, you know what? I probably should follow dad. That follow through of them making that decision to follow without requiring food to do it. Without requiring excitement to do it. Yes. That's how you build relationship leadership and relationship. Yeah, leadership relationship. Yeah. We should have just said it at the same time. Let me switch <laughs> words. All right, one more time. One, two, three. Leader Zoom. Okay, all right, guys. So you can tune back in next week, Wednesday, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Send your questions through Instagram, TikTok, private messaging, direct message, whatever the heck we do. Uh, you can throw, you can throw on a YouTube video comment if you yeah. want to. You and, and please include the, please include, no, don't give her something else to do. Please include uh, the age of your puppy and the breed of your puppy. Yep, helps us tremendously to answer your questions. See you next week, guys. See you guys.